it's very interesting that um, I started work really in the early 80s and especially when I was working in London we were doing these amazing pieces for this fashion house um, and we basically the younger generation of people really hark to the 80s and I'm getting asked to make the same styles again <laughs> You've come back with fashion. I've come back, we've come all the way around and we gave up doing them because they were very distinctive and they were very 80s, so in the 90s onwards no one really wanted to know about it. They are remarkably cool as well, I must say, I do enjoy doing them, but uh, it's sort of what I cut my teeth on now and I find it a little amusing that I'm being asked, including my daughter for her 18th birthday, we, we made this, this ring that I could easily have made when I was an apprentice. This is the Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 75 of 100. Today on the show, I have Gerard Smith from Glisten Jewelry, and we're going to be talking about what goes into making amazing jewelry, and for an audience or a person looking to buy jewelry, what are some of the things that you need to look for when you go into the store? Uh, we're sitting here in your jewelry shop now, uh, Gerard. Great to have you on the show. Thank you, thank you very much. So what is the, the first thing that when someone comes through the door, you know, what are they usually looking for and then how do you help them uncover their needs? I think most, all couples are unique and individual, but if they come in to my store, often they're looking for something that they can't get in the chain stores and something that reflects their personality um, as a couple and that's what we try to work with and bring forward. So I normally start by congratulating them for, uh, for making the big step and uh, listening to, most people have, a, have an idea roughly of what they're after. So we normally start by listening and um, working out how it is that we can help them. And then look, we either have something in the store for them, but uh, about 85% of what we do is made to order. So we often will then have a talk about making something up for them specifically. Because it is quite a big moment that when you ask someone, will you marry me, there is a, a lifelong commitment that's going to go with the answer to that question, uh, if it goes the right way, then the jewellery is the signifying both to the external world and to each other that that commitment has been made. So usually it's the first time. Now, if it's the first time doing something, usually you, you need a lot of guidance so when they come to you, what type of guidance, you know, how, how do you know how, how big the, the diamond should be or what colour the gold should be or should it even be diamonds and gold? Normally we find that out within the first few minutes. Um, people that come in to see us generally have a fairly good idea. Um, so again, it's part of that listening process. And really to me, I always say to people, it's about the finger you wear it on. There's no expectation on price, and and especially in New Zealand, it really is it's signified by the finger. And we do work for people in silver. We've we've mounted um, uh, beach stones from the from pebbles from yeah, in a very contemporary way. Or we do the very traditional platinum classic diamond ring. It really is right across the board. And, and uh, I wouldn't say I prefer one over the other. We just enjoy uh, being involved in the process with people. But people are becoming more creative and more open to different ideas. Okay, it's, so it's our experience. You've yeah. got the traditional side of the, the jewelry business and then the contemporary side. Um, what makes you different from some of those big chain stores and in, in how you can create the, the jewelry? A lot of um, a lot of jewelry in the chain stores specifically is sold on terms. I mean, we do offer finance for people, but. Uh, generally speaking, it's it's not taken up. Um, a lot of most of the jewellery is manufactured overseas, uh, where labour rates are quite low, and are made from castings. So, especially we do do casting here, and and uh, that does have a role in a place. But especially for the engagement rings, they're often handcrafted or certainly designed specifically for the person that we're that we're doing. Uh, people too come in with so much ideas now, we often sit down with Google Images 
and find, oh, I like the shoulder on that, I like the look on this, and it gives us an indication of size. So we often piece together a design, and, and our challenge is to make it um, aesthetically beautiful and um, something that reflects the relationship of the people that have come in to see us, that have entrusted us with it. Now you've been doing this for some time, uh, 27 years in gemology. How does the, the style or the fashion of jewellery change um, over that period of time? Is there some things that are, are timeless classics versus some things that are uh, more interesting or, or fashion driven? There are timeless classics that we've made and have been made for generations before us as well. Um, especially if you've got a large stone or a la you know a large gemstone or diamond, often the feature is in, in the craft and the in the platinum work or the gold work is to have as little interfering with with the display of that stone. So we're basically making a subtle cradle, especially in platinum, where we can work fine, um, just to to bring that to life. But that's not what everyone requires, and um, we've done work recently where. The young couple were just huge enthusiasts of Art Nouveau and we incorporated these beautiful lily patterns into the shoulders and you know we, we it, it's a different journey for everybody and um, the challenge of what we do and what we enjoy is doing a diverse range of things. We, we don't like to be pigeonholed, yes we do do the classics and we try to do them as, as subtly and, and as understated as possible but we have a lot of fun also with, uh, with the designer side. Now this isn't your first jewellery shop, Glisten uh, Jewellery is the second, Yes. Um, prior to this you had was it Bloom's Jewellers. What got you into jewellery and then ha what took me through that, that career of you know, running a business to such a stage where you then sell it and then stop doing jewellery for a while and then get back into um, the business with Glisten now? Sure, well I... Uh didn't particularly enjoy school and I don't think they particularly enjoyed my presence here either so we, we both come to a, to a mutually beneficial arrangement where I left when I was 15 and I was very fortunate um, through connections that my family had. I basically moved to Taupo uh, from New Plymouth and uh, uh, was apprenticed to a very traditional jeweller up there just, just shortly before he retired. So, so I did a four year apprenticeship then was fortunate enough to come to uh, Hawke's Bay and I worked for McClurg's, worked for David McClurg and, and um, ended up running the workshop there for a couple of years before going to the UK and working. Um, upon returning from there after about three years, uh, my wife and I had this vision that we wanted to set up a jewellery store, which, which we did in Blooms, so we founded that. And um, I seemed to have a reasonably short attention span and uh, after 10 years I was quite keen to do something different. And in fact, when we set up Bloom's the business plan and, and the thing from the start was that it was a 10 year journey. We didn't actually see ourselves probably doing it for much longer. How did that then uh, shape what you were doing over that 10 years? That was, would have been different if, than if you decided this was going to be a business you were going to operate for life. I think that um, we were very aware of stock levels and selling because jewellery businesses are notoriously hard to sell. If you run a business and you're, you're successful, you just constantly build stock. Until you build your business to a point where it's very hard for people to come in and, you know, the succession side of things is fraught. You end up generally leaving quite a lot of money in and never really being clear. So with a 10 year cap, I think it, it held the stock levels to a, certain, to a certain point. And we were fortunate enough to find a very good buyer who still runs that business today um, successfully. So. Yeah, it's, uh, it's just a different approach. I think it's, it was more to do succession and also my intention span. I, I love setting things up and getting them going. That's the exciting bit. And, uh, to, and to do it all again is, always, is even better. So You're right. I'm probably uh, the, the same in that. I enjoy the, the moments of the unknown, whether it's a few weeks or a few years. That's a, it's always quite an exciting time because it can go either way. Um, once you're soul blooms though then you've got the opposite which is what do i do now and i'm sure you've probably had some golden handcuffs that that said there's certain things you couldn't do uh, including open up in the competition so what does a an expert jeweler do when they can't do jewelry well i we it was always our plan to have another stint overseas that was why we put the business on the market and just a lifestyle choice um, my wife 
um, was was very keen to travel again as well. And our daughter was at a great age at uh, at the time at um, still at primary school. So we relocated to the UK, and I still worked as a jeweller over there, but it was just um, on more of a casual basis. So we had a lot of time off, and we spent a very nice three years. Was that in that the Hatton Garden area of no, the jewellery? We were mostly based around Cornwall, okay. and then we lived in the south of France for um, a few months before we came back. So, Does jewellery, um, it, does it change depending on country? Is it country specific, or are there some sort of global rules for, for how things are done? I think it is very much country specific. There are definitely, or certainly culturally specific, uh, we still do things probably in a very similar manner to the UK. The pieces often seem to be a bit finer, whereas often here generally we're a bit more bold with what we do. Um, you've got the the Indian and Arabic traditions, which are very heavily centred on uh, dowry jewellery and, and high carat gold and heavy pieces um, that are only worn on occasions. Uh, I worked in America for a while in Ventura and uh, the styles there are very very different as well so yeah it's not always translated we see it with the cruise boats here a lot of the time the american people don't we, i understand they just don't get what we do they don't you know there are some things that here that, that are right across the board but um yeah there, there are definitely regional styles and, and things that are popular for cultural reasons okay so for a business like yours then where you could make jewelry for anyone around the world does that then reduce your ability to, to service other countries or, or based on the relationships you've had from people coming in here, does that then help you, you know, sustain getting more business once they return back home? Yeah, it's, it's never really been easier to stay in touch with styles. Um, Google Images is a fantastic tool and, and even the online magazines and things now, you don't even have to hold subscriptions so much or you can subscribe to your own. So yeah, it's quite easy to stay up with the play as to what's happening around the place. Yeah. Uh, we see more than half our turnover out, outside of Hawke's Bay um, and we export most of that. So we've got clients that we service in the US and in, um, and in the UK, which is, it's quite a strength given Hawke's Bay is very seasonal. We're, we're on an Art Deco Sunday here, you and I are at the moment and the place is packed and you know, this time of year, it's very easy to stay busy from basically December through to through to March, just with the local trade and what's happening. But uh, you, you can't run a business on three months of the year, so you need to be able to you need to be able to diversify out. Now, with many of the people I've interviewed so far in the, the series, technology is uh, playing a, a greater role in business now than it ever has. And from I guess what anyone may have read about the diamond trade is there's some really interesting things happening where not only do you or can you dig them out of the ground uh, you can also now grow them in yes. labs um, diamonds historically were known as something that were scarce and therefore yeah, that's that's where a lot of their intrinsic value came from when something can be grown on demand how does that change the supply and demand? Uh, and how do you educate a, an audience or a customer base um, on the attributes of, of either? Because we've got, you know, the millennials are coming through now, they have certain um, perceptions and beliefs about jewelry that may be different from the previous generation, um, and that may help them buy more diamonds or, or less, depending on the, the values that go with it. Uh, how do you make sense of, of all of that? It's something that's been played out at the moment and really, I mean synthetic diamonds have been around for a long time. I saw the first ones that were that uh, when I was doing a gemology course at John Cass College in London in the mid 80s and they come in with these curiosities that have been grown in the late, I believe the late 40s or early 50s by General Electric. Um, they've known how to do it for quite some time What's been a barrier is, until recently, the diamonds were quite grayish, and um, although they were often quite clean, they weren't high in colour, and they were never really considered a threat to the jewellery industry. The other thing is, they take an incredible amount of heat and pressure to grow, and I think the electric bill for, um, <laughs> for growing a carrot stone back then 
would have been five or six times uh, what the value of a, of a normal um, going to buy one out of the jeweler's window. So I think that the, the amount of energy used was initially a barrier, but like all things, technology gets better and better. Um, those costs have come down over time, they've just become more efficient at growing them. And there's been a lot of money put into the growing of synthetics generally, um, a lot of military research money, um, because there's applications outside of jewellery for, for, for very clean, large, synthetically grown crystals in the laser industry and, and quite a few. So I believe that's where a lot of the, these changes have, have come about. Um, an answer to your question as to how it's going to affect the, the natural price, I think the jury's still out on that. that they really have only been available um, over the last couple of years in, in commercial qualities. And the prices at the moment are often about, I would say, it's a bit hard to generalise, but they seem to be about just less than half of what the equivalent natural stone would be, um, which is still quite a lot of money for something that's synthetic. Uh, and I think those prices will continue to drop, um, just again as the numbers increase of the availability of them. And they are coming on exponentially, I believe. Having said all that, this isn't our first rodeo in the jewellery industry. We've had synthetic sapphire, synthetic emerald for a very long period of time, since the 1880s, 1890s, they first started growing for nice synthetic ruby. So we've seen this with other stones and, and our experiences and the indicators seem to be that there's going to become a two-tier market. There will be pieces with synthetic stones in, and alongside, offered alongside the natural goods and there will be a big price difference between them. So we have experience in this and, and in a lot of ways I think it's going to generate uh, more interest in the natural stones. People, especially in engagement rings, they don't want a man-made product or an inferior product. There's a beauty and charm of getting some ancient fossilised carbon that's been elevated by a volcano and discovered and cut to precision. I think that that doesn't go away. So, but again, the jury's out. We shall know, we shall, we shall know the answer in five or 10 years, I'm sure. Interesting, because you, there is those two sides where um, one is the story behind how it's been manufactured and where it's come from, and the other one is the, the innate um, qualities of having something great at a price that may be half what it would have cost to have the, the story and the, the provenance around it. Um, when someone's gifting jewellery, I guess it's going to come down to how important that story is versus maybe they're buying for other reasons. Like I, I, I read that, that millennials are spending um, nearly $26 billion on on diamonds, um, and that's come from De Beers, from uh, the CEO, Bruce Cleaver there. So they're obviously buying diamonds, at least the, the next generation of the marketplace. Um, do, what do you see in, in Hawke's Bay here from that generation? What are the, the attributes that are important to them that maybe weren't important to the previous generation? I think we often talk about um, the ethical source of diamonds. It's very important. No one wants to have an engagement ring on their finger that's tainted by blood and civil war. And I think the movie um, Blood Diamond is, is often quoted. There's a process that the industry's had in place for, for I'm, I'm a little unsure, probably about at least 15, 20 years, um, called the Kimberley Process, which monitors where rough has come from, and they're all sold through a channel. So it's not a marketing channel as such, but one of the first ethical channels that was set up. The actual movie Blood Diamond as well, I mean, it was very accurate probably as to what was happening at that time. But even when that movie came out, um, it was set 20 years previous. So I'm not, you know, I think that it was a major issue for jewellery, especially in the 80s. Um, and I'm not saying all the problems are solved, but it's still a work in progress. But to date, it seems, the company process seems to be working well and valid. I think the ethical question is the first one that's raised, you know, having done this for, for quite some time. And it's something we address, we only sell Kimberley process diamonds. And also the metal we use is um, sustainably sourced and often from recycled um, gold that we buy off the bullion dealer in Auckland. So I think that's, that's, that's probably the first one. The second one is the question of synthetics aren't raised a lot. Most people, although they are aware of them, are not considering them. So that's a pretty interesting market indicator. The, the main differences in styles over that time, 
as we've mentioned earlier, we have the classics that I think we will always do. We do little variations on them. At the moment, we're setting tiny little diamonds into the side of these, these little sculptures, which is because these diamonds are available, we can now get them fully cut under 0.8 of a millimetre, which is smaller than a pinhead. We have to work with them under magnification and, and certainly get amazing effect. So that, that's sort of a new thing that, that we've been doing for the last four or five years. Um, it's very interesting that um, I started work really in the early 80s, and especially when I was working in London, we were doing these amazing pieces for this fashion house. Um, and we basically, the younger generation of people really hark to the 80s, and I'm getting asked to make the same styles again. <laughs> You've come back with fashion. I've come back, we've come all the way around, and we gave up doing them because they were very distinctive and they were very 80s, so in the 90s onwards, no one really wanted to know about it. They are remarkably cool as well, I must say. I do enjoy doing them, but uh, it's sort of what I cut my teeth on now, and I find it a little amusing that I'm being asked, including my daughter for her 18th birthday, we, we made this this ring that I could easily have made when I was an apprentice. So I hope to put some of the, uh, the photos up with the interview so we can see some of the examples, but it's hard to get across without, uh, without the visuals. Certainly, yeah. What are some of the, the, um, the new processes that with you know, 3D technology and, and with some of the, the computing power that um, we now have available to us in business, what are some of the things you can do now um, sculpturally that maybe you've only dreamed about being able to do up until recently? It's, it's probably the biggest change. Even It has more direct effect to us than changes through synthetics, through the the gemstone industry. That's gone on for years and this is, I, I honestly think the synthetic diamonds are just just the next cap off the ring. We've seen it before and we, we're reasonably confident we know how that journey is going to pan out. Um, what's really exciting for us is um, CAD design. We, we own the software here and I have a contractor who assists me on complex things as well. It's because my computer skills are still leave a little bit to be desired at times and, and they are complex to use. But the um, being able to present a photograph to a client of what we're proposing to make, showing four views, and then just being able to easily make changes for that, often while they're here in store, is just an exciting design tool. It really takes the mystery, um, it takes the risk out for the client. They know what they're going to get at the end of it. And it's so much easier to change, make little changes on the computer than after the piece is finished. And then of course in recent, more recent years, being able to wax print sections of those designs and cast them has really taken time out of doing the job, um, you know, on the manufacturing side of things. You know, some jobs that we were spending 15, 20 hours on, um, we could now make using that technology in five. Interesting. So you not only can create more complex works and specific things uh, that may not have been possible in the past, but it can actually take less time. Exactly, and it, it allows us more freedom with the design. We can put more detail in. We could always have done the same by hand, but it would just be, I mean, it may have added eight hours to the job, um, which would obviously cost the client a lot more. I think the most exciting thing for us is, over the time I've been involved in the jewellery industry, We've seen a change. We've seen where, when I first started, things were still mass produced. There were a lot of companies locally, a lot of big wholesale companies uh, making pieces for the mass market. Over my career, that had, has pretty much completely disappeared. For example, today, if, if, if a production jeweler was earning $30 an hour, that same work can be done in Thailand or in China or Vietnam by very skilled people as well. Um, and they would might be earning three dollars an hour, so it's just impossible to compete against that. And we lost a large section of value-wise retail, maybe from under three thousand dollars, where we just couldn't compete on the labour. We just couldn't look at. There was no money for us in doing that job. Um, and then it grew over the years to pretty much there wasn't much we could do under five thousand dollars, unless the clients were providing a lot of their own metal or a lot of their own stones, which we do that work as well. But what this CAD technology has changed is it's dropped. We can be, compete now against the chain stores up to about, I reckon, around about 2,000, 2,200 retail price entry level. So it's opened, we're charging less hours out per job. We're 
charging more or less the same hourly rate. There's a little bit of allowance because the technology is expensive. But we're just able to do so much more work. We've so we've got opened up the possibility of doing work for a far larger number of clients. That's usually quite rare in an industry where you get to be more creative and more complex, yet at a lower cost. I can't think. This is where technology is changing, and it's not just us. We're an example. And in fact, the end of the market that it changed was the handmade unique end, which I thought technology would never change. Now, we don't use this for every job because the metal is cast. If we're doing an expensive piece, we still hand make it. But it just opens up another whole scope of work uh, for us below that. It's still a very good quality product, but the handmade, the, the handmade work is, is hardened and it's the best way I can describe it is if you were to take a piece of cast iron and grind through it, when you look closer you'll see the flecks and the cavities from the casting, whereas a piece of hand forged steel or hand forged iron even, if you took a section across it, it's dead smooth because all it's all been condensed by working and it's the same with this. So we still hand make a lot. What we are doing a little bit as well is mixing in some cast detail componentry but the areas where we we're concerned about where we're still hand making. So it's a tool, the cat is a tool that's not a magic wand, but it, it does have some serious applications for certain jobs. And we're very excited. It's given us a whole new um, scope of clients that we can, we can deal with purely from a price point of view. So I guess then the, the challenge or the opportunity for you is being able to get the message out there that uh, people can come in with designs that are meaningful to them and ask you for a way of how should I or could I bring this to life in, in, in metals, in settings, um, and then you can give them the option of whether that's going to be 3D printed or handmade or a combination of the two. And that's exactly how we approach it. Um, and it depends on the job. The wax printing is not free. You know, there are, by the time you buy time at a printer, we've made a decision not to own one. A lot of jewelers um, will embrace this technology own their own. But I struggle to keep a normal printer running, just with ink. So I look at these things. The printer we use as well isn't just a normal 3D printer. Um, it's basically, a, it's basically uh, a milling machine. So it starts with a block of plastic or wax, and it mills the majority of the design. And it then goes over top and prints the fine detail. So they're, they're very large and very expensive. and. Um, yeah, I, I would rather someone else had that capital outlay and we just buy time in it. We, we, I still believe it's the most cost-effective way of doing it. I think what's interesting there, Jared, is that it, although you have the, the skills and experience in the traditional ways of making jewellery, you're not afraid. In fact, you're encouraging the innovation through technology and then just picking and choosing as needed for a customer. That, that's pretty much how we view it. Um, I was resist resistant at first um, I was scared that the technology was going to dumb down what we do but in actual fact the way that most jewelers are using it it's, uh, we, we view it now as another tool in, in the arsenal um, a lot of people that don't embrace it I, I don't believe are probably going to uh, be in business in five or six years is where I see this journey going I saw one of the pieces you did and I think that's one of the reasons I reached out to you where uh, it was this egg-shaped um, gold, like, just phenomenally uh, encrusted with tiny little diamonds around it, and it just it looked so delicate. Um, talk a little bit of, about that, because that wasn't just something you were doing for a, for a customer, that was more of a, uh, there was some, a charity side to it as well. Yeah, we, we donated that um, for, to the uh, Hawke's Bay Charity Wine Auction through a lot offered by Tony Bush Wines. Um, and we wanted to do something that could showcase this technology. And we, it was inspired by Fabergé egg. And we could always have handmade that, but it would have taken months in the style that Fabergé's workmen would have, uh, would have, would have spent, uh, it would have had to have been shelled. There would have been a lot of platinum wastage come off it. It was basically, there was about an ounce of platinum in, the, in it as it was finished. Um, we could always have done it, but the reality is that it, that it would have just been too expensive, really, for anyone. So we printed those components, and then we, there was a gallery with a great leaf surrounding it to tie it into the auction theme. Um, 
and and set all the diamonds. So it was still a lot of work. I think that piece it was almost two weeks um, of of uh, tradesman time working on it. Myself and um, uh, Michael McGrail spent a lot of time on it. And we we got it completed. The um, it was just good to showcase what the technology can do, and it was a very good way of getting that message out there. And the upside was that the, the sale of the piece on the lot um, raised about $15,500, so it was, it was, which and the entire lot went to Cranford Hospice, so we're very proud to have supported them in that. That's fantastic. Outside of jewellery, your, your creative um, juices still flow and there are other things that you are, you're working on. We, we covered a couple before we turned, put the record button on. Um, what, what are some of those things? We've done, we're sort of the first thing that we've, that I, I tend to go on focusing on something for four or five years that holds my attention and then I find something else to do. So I don't know whether that's a blessing or a curse, but it, it does keep life interesting. And uh, I was doing, when we first started Glisten about nine years ago, we, we, I, we were doing quite a lot of mixed media artwork. So I was oil on canvas on a very heavy background. And then I was making contemporary gold and silver sculptural forms. Um, when I was living in Cornwall, I was quite inspired by the Jack and Jill walls, which are the, these herring bone shaped stone walls that was the traditional pattern there. So I started reproducing them um, and did some paintings on those. And I brought one back to New Zealand and received a commission uh, from a patron that was building a house really in many ways to, ha to houses modern contemporary art collection so we did two of these pieces over about three years um, and they were quite major pieces and all of the metal into it was all recycled um, all Kimberley processed diamonds going in I think it was about 30 carat of diamonds went into it and um, large metal pieces um, in contemporary form uh, and gold and silver up to about 1.2 metres tall. So they were more in tone with sculpture probably than anything else. And then onto a backing. It's so very hard to describe, but it's on a website under Jared Smith. Um, if, you, if, you, if anyone listening would be care to see them. And then we went on and, and at the moment I'm working on a, um, a, a Maori design theme that I'm playing with as well that I've been messing around with on or off for the last 18 months. Uh, but on top of that, I've taken to, um, I don't know why, to, to creative writing. So I've written the odd short story um, and also been working on a novel that's due to be published this year. Uh, the manuscript was, there, there was a, a New Zealand Society of Authors run a manuscript competition every two years and we were fortunate enough to be uh, highly commended and recommended from that. So it's given us good, it's given me good cause to keep writing and keep playing with it so so that will come out later this year so that's something else I, I think that if you're a, a creative person um, I think it's very easy to trip across other other media to express your express what you want to get out and I'm thoroughly enjoying the writing and um, meeting and spending time with, with the writing community here in Hawke's Bay too it's been a treat do you find that being uh, having these different uh, creative outflows that one helps the other? Do they Are they symbiotic or do you get like a, a break from one and enough time to kind of reflect on the jewellery while you're book writing and vice versa to then come back to it fresh? I think that, um, that they are all interlinked. I think that if they're all coming from the same part of the brain um, and I'm lucky because from such a young age, from basically from 15, I've worked in the, in the creative industry all my life. We we um, we still do hand drawing and hand painting of designs often before we CAD. So I'll, I'll often hand paint five or six ideas to give people an idea that we can then CAD up. Um, so I've never really thought about it. It's just something I've always done. And in fact, it's only really in the last few years I've come to understand that not everyone thinks in that way. And uh, but I do enjoy. Uh, it's not a matter of enjoying. I sort of feel driven to to make and create things, so I think that'll continue. That's interesting, because when I interviewed David Truebridge, one of the things he said was that creativity can't be willed, and the ideas came to him as they came to him. And it sounds like you're kind of similar, that, that you're, you're compelled to uh, draw the designs, 
but not necessarily in a, in a structured way. It, and I think you are right. I think your best work comes from inspiration. When you're working commercially, um, you know, often you have to come up with ideas. Sometimes you'll be standing, you've got a client coming in the next day and you're looking at a blank piece of paper with your, with your paintbrush in your hand and a, and, a, and, a, and a pen and you're thinking, well, yeah. So I think you can, to a degree, pressure it. You, you'll often sort of start drawing and then come back to it. A deadline's good. I, I, I operate under a deadline basis because if I don't have one, um, it, 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 it draws on and on and I never stop playing with it. it absolutely. <laughs> like I'm the same. I, when I do some of the prep for the interviews, I'll, I'll do a very broad, fun prep, maybe a week or two out, just kind of getting the, to the gist of what, where's the curiosity, where's the line of questioning? And then, you know, the day before the pressure's on, it's like I've got to actually get this stuff in my head so we can just have a chat. Um, so it's interesting that, that the creativity and design has that same interplay for you. And, and talking to, to creative people, it's surprising everyone works differently. It, it, there, are, there is no set pattern. I think it comes to people in very different ways. And uh, but that's what's unique about it and, and, and what we treasure. Which is quite unique in that that's exactly what goes through all of your jewellery work as well, is that it is unique um, to the individual. That's what we aim for, and, and uh, I stress the point that we're big on listening. Um, people, we give direction um, if we think that people are going down a path that, that perhaps can be done better, but we're always respectful, and at the end of the day, we'll make what people want. So some people require quite a large creative input from us, and we happily give that. That's 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 a fun thing. But equally, we you know we we're we're a commercial studio, and we're about giving people. For us, the only thing that matters. I don't spend any money on advertising. It's entirely word of mouth. But what we rely on are people being proud of their ring that we make, or their creations on their fingers, or, or necklaces. Talking to their friends, and we find that's that's a nice way of growing business. And to date, it seems to have worked for us. Excellent. I've really enjoyed this chat with you, Gerard, and uh, understanding a little bit more into the jewellery business, one of the oldest on the planet, yet one of the ones going through some of the most uh, fastest transformations now with what's available with 3D printing and some of these uh, gems and, and diamonds that can be manufactured. Uh, so I think for anyone listening that is looking for creating a special piece or commemorating something or repurposing something they already have, um, what an amazing time to be able to do that now. Thank you very much and I've, I've enjoyed the interview process. You're nice welcome. To, nice to talk to you. Good to catch up. Cheers, Cheers right. If you like this episode, remember to subscribe for free on iTunes. Simply search for The Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes Store.